right, guys. In 2012, my next guest set out on a dream to become the champion of the world. And now in 2024, after beating the best of the best for over a decade, he stands here, the undisputed UFC welterweight champion. Remember the name, Bilal Muhammad. Welcome for the very first time to Submission Radio, man. <laughs> What's up, brother? Thank you for having me, man. Appreciate you. Yeah, man. Well, the pleasure's all mine. And I got to say, dude, like, it's pretty crazy, right? The other week I saw you had the big parade in Chicago. What was that like for you, man, being able to bring back that belt to Chicago? It felt great, man. Uh, to have my own parade, we had uh, we had a lot of my family there, a lot of my friends there. And, you know, growing up in Chicago, you had, like, the Bulls, the Sox, the Cubs, mm. all those parades. And to be able to go to those parades and now have my own parade, uh, it was just an amazing experience in general. You know, Chicago hasn't had a, a champion in a while. So for, for us to bring the belt back home and get gold in Chicago, it feels good. Yeah, dude, you were even on the morning show over there, and you mentioned how you used to watch the morning show growing up and how big of a deal that was. And for me, that kind of struck a chord because it's kind of like, you know, growing up, you're like, I wonder if one day I'll be on the big morning show here. What was that like for you, man, coming down there? It was cool, right? Because you're sitting there and you're like, they invite you to that show and you're like, oh, man, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> and then, like, the, the first thing the lady asked me is, you're the champion of street fighting, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, it was awkward, but it was the morning show. So I was like, whatever, man. Yeah, we're cool, man. Yeah, it's it's not street fighting, it's UFC, but it's crazy that there's still people out here that don't know what UFC is. And I thought we were like past that, but it's whatever, man. It's It was just cool to experience. Like I said, to be able to, to watch those shows when I was younger, for my, my parents still watch those shows. So now to be on that show in Chicago is cool. Dude, that's huge. And that lady needs a little education or what <laughs> the UFC is all about. The, the interview. <laughs> I know. It's like, ah, oh, it's the street fighting champion. That sounds about right. Um, dude, it's uh, been what? Like, it's been a good amount of time now since he won the belt against Leon Edwards. And you've had a chance for it to set in, sort of reflect on it, marinate a little bit. Um, tell me, man, how do you sort of reflect back on that awesome performance against Leon and the whole experience of winning the belt in Manchester? Uh, I mean, the, the experience in general in Manchester was amazing. We, we met some amazing people there. Mm. The fans there were, were, were great to get the support that I got from over there. And I had so many people from Chicago come out there with me and just to have my family, my friends there. And, you know, the whole week, I just felt a calmness about everything just because I know how hard I worked. I know I belonged there. I know I was uh, meant to be there for that reason. And my whole journey of getting there was a rough road, right? It took forever mm -hmm. to get there. So I was like, I'm just going to – I'm going to appreciate everything and I'm going to enjoy this whole week. So that whole week I was just having fun. I was chill the whole time. And then when I got in the cage, it just reflected on the fight, right? Because I didn't leave no stone unturned. I worked harder than I ever worked for that fight. And to go in there and dominate him the way I dominated him when a lot of people around the world never was giving me a chance. And to prove a lot of people wrong and to prove my coaches and team right – uh, that was the best part because we're a small team in Chicago. We have, uh, we're not the biggest, uh, the biggest names here. We don't have 50 UFC fighters in our gym, uh, but we have like a small family gym. And I got those people that are with me from the start that I've been with since high school, since, you know, uh, I've been with the same team 12 years. That I've been training with, uh, these guys that are in my corner working with me. So to be able to do everything with just us and to see the road, we all work together. We all been to the ups, the downs together and to enjoy the championship together was amazing. Oh, dude. I mean, it was an incredible performance by you. Absolutely amazing. Um, you were able to get the belt with you. And it was a long journey to the belt, like you mentioned. Like, a lot of ups, a lot of downs, a lot of rough patches. You trying to get the fights that you needed to get to get to the belt. When you think back to your journey in the UFC, what do you think was sort of the toughest time for you when you look back on it? Honestly, the probably the toughest time in general is maybe these last two years. Uh, and it was just the waiting game, right? Because mm. I, f I felt like I did enough. I, I was stuck in limbo of like, when is it going to happen? What's going to, what else do I got to do? I beat this guy, I beat this guy, I beat this guy. Even all these guys now that are talking, I'm like, I had to beat four top five guys to even get my name mentioned uh, for a title shot. And then even mm. after beating Gilbert Burns, when they guaranteed me a title shot, it was still like, man, is it still going to happen? Is it really going to happen? Because it was such a long road. So that two years was the hardest part because, you know, you're getting skipped over. You're getting talks of getting skipped over. And then in my head, I'm looking like, what else do I got to do? 
I, I did every, everything. I've beaten everybody. I'm basically fighting guys that are number one contenders. So it's like I'm a champion defending my belt every single one of these fights. Um, but, you know, God's plan is the best plan. So, like, being religious, I just trust God no matter what. And I know that his story is, is already written for me. So I can't sit there and stress about all this other stuff, negative stuff. There's going to be people. There's going to be haters. There's going to be doubters. But in the end, my small circle, my family, my team, those are the only ones. Those are the only voices that matter. And they're all pushing me, motivating me, telling me it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And when it happened, it was the best time. Mm, what was the feeling when the belt actually got wrapped around your waist? Uh, I literally just got asked the same question by Joe. Uh, and I was like, for me, it was more so beating Leon, right? Because those three years that I was after that fight, it was, you had to hear it the whole time. Leon would have beat him. Leon would have beat him. Those other four rounds would have happened the way this happened, that happened. And I'm telling him, like, it wouldn't have. That wouldn't have happened. But, you know, fans aren't the smartest. A lot of these guys are just haters, they're trolls, and they just want to sit there and just pounce at you until you give them a reply. So I had to hear it from them the whole time. And even fight week, you had to hear it from them. Even Leon's team, they were so cocky. Uh, but I knew that I could beat him. I knew that I was better than him everywhere. And so for me to go in there and win it and win the belt, it was more so I just cared about beating Leon. Now that I had the belt around my waist, that's for my team. That's for my coaches. Obviously for my people that needed a victory to have the, for, have, for them to have gold now. Uh, that's all for them. For me, it was like, I knew I was better than Leon. I knew I was better than his team, and I proved it. Yeah, man. Obviously, like your nickname is Remember the Name, and now you're a part of this really exclusive club of a select few people that were able to hold a UFC world title, right? And I just want to get your thoughts on this. Obviously, there's a long list of legends in your division through UFC history. Let's just put GSP aside because obviously he's a legend and you know, in the talks of one of the greatest to ever do it. But at, if you had to sort of pick who you think is your second favorite or the mo second most accomplished UFC champion behind him, you've got Kamara Usman, you've got Tyron Woodley, you've got Matt Hughes, you know, you've got other names in that division like Robbie Lawler. Who do you think, who's that number two spot for you when you look at all the previous champions? I mean, I think they're all, most of them are all like different eras, right? Because mm. even at the beginning, it was like Matt Hughes was this and then GSP took over. And then all of a sudden GSP left and T Woodley had a, a great run and people forget about his run and his knockouts. And he beat Robbie Lawler, who's had some of the best fights I've ever seen. So it's like, for me, I just think all these fighters, fighters just had their moments in their different eras. Right now, my era is with Usman and I think I'm better than Usman. And I, when I was, when I look at him and I look at my fights, I was always chasing him, right? Cause he was the one on top. So mm -hmm. I always had my style, and I always thought my style could beat him. So all I could really do now is compete against the guys that I could touch, and he's the one I could touch. So I would say I'm obviously better. I think I'm better than Usman. So my goal now is I always put gold as the goal. Now GOAT is the goal. So like, I want my name to be, to be right there where there isn't a clear number two under GSP, but I'm chasing GSP. I want to be right there next to him. I don't even want to be chased. I don't want it to be like, who's number two when you talk about the welterweight division. I want to be like, man, Bully and GSP were the best welterweights in that division to ever do it. And if I get ahead of him, I get ahead of him. But like, I want to be neck and neck with him. And I think with these young guys that are next, right? You got the Shavkots, the JDM, the Ian Gary. And then if I do get Usman, having those names on my resume, which is already a great resume, I don't, I don't think anybody could uh, complain if I compare myself to him. Oh, yeah, man. It's an absolute killer's row in the welterweight division. You can even go back in time and be like, wow, like the guys in the top 10 right now are absolutely devastating. On Kamara Usman, though, Bilal, um, obviously you guys have had a lot of respect for each other. Now that you're the champion, he kind of has his sights set on you. Obviously, he wants another shot at the title. And he's kind of like respectfully building a feud between you guys. I know he was on the podcast talking about how he feels like he's better in every area than you. Um, what have you made of this sort of feud that's building between you guys now that you're the champion? I mean, it's funny because he's not better at taking head kicks like than me, right? Uh, we both fought the same guy recently, and I dominated Leon. And he lost to him twice. So you're not better than me everywhere. For me, like you said, I got respect for for him. He was one of the, the best welterweights, obviously. He had a, a great run when he was the champion, but... When I was calling his name when he was a champion, he was acting like I didn't exist. He was acting like there was nobody else in the division. He was doing rematches with Masvidal, doing rematches with Kobe, and he was acting like there was nobody else when 
you still had me and Luke were on big streaks when he was a champion and he didn't give us the opportunity. He didn't, he didn't say, let me fight the next best guy on the biggest streak. He said, Oh, let me get the, the obviously the money fight with, with Masvidal. Uh, but I don't think Masvidal earned it at that time. Like if you wanted to cement yourself as the best welterweight, you do what a, like a Adesanya did or a Volkanovsky, who's the next best guy. Who's the guy that's right there. And he didn't do that. So for him to say like, now he's calling my name. Now, like, oh, now you notice me because I have the target on my back. But before you act like you didn't know who I was, I've been chasing you. I've been here. I've been talking. Mm. In all reality, how do you think a fight between you guys would actually look? Honestly, I think I dominate him. I think I'm when – I, when I said it before that when I was – people were asking me about the Leon fight and how I'm going to do it. And he just fought Kobe and he fought Usman. And, you know, he had a great camp for both of those guys. I'm better than both of those guys. I'm better than both of those guys everywhere. Those, you know, he's a national champion wrestler, yada, yada, yada. And I took Leon down with uh, high school wrestling. I beat, took him down more than anybody else has taken him down, right? Because I'm mm -hmm. a better martial artist. I'm a better MMA fighter. I have higher IQ than all these guys. When you compare me to all these guys, I'm on a different level than them. Mm -hmm. So when you compare me to Usman, I'm faster than them. I'm stronger than them. I'm better at wrestling than them. So for his game plan to, to fight me, it would he would assume that it would be like a kickboxing match with Kobe, uh, where they just went back and forth. There was no wrestling in it. But I'll take Usman down, and then I'll beat him up on the feet. Kobe sucks in striking, and Usman went to war with them. Right? They were going back and forth, and Kobe literally sucks. So people look at those wars and think that was a great fight, and you know people sit there and sell their own narrative that this guy was one of the best welterweights. Look what he did to Kobe. Kobe was one of the best. But you just saw what Leon did to Kobe. He embarrassed him. And you saw what I did with Leon, I embarrassed them. So what did I tell you where I am compared to Usman and Kobe? Hmm. It's interesting because Usman is in a position where he's likely going to have to fight again, right? To even have the ability to fight you for the title. And the guy that's sort of in the talks of fighting Kamaru is, you know, a local Aussie in Jack Della, JDM. And, you know, he's far from an easy fight for Kamaru um, and far from a lock. Like, how do you even think a Kamara Usman versus JDM fight would go? JDM's in the peak of his career and he looks like he's on a tear. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's another one of those young guys that's on a good streak right now. Right. And then mm. for him to, to finish Gilbert Burns is huge. Uh, but when you're looking back at that Gilbert Burns fight, Gilbert Burns took him down and controlled him pretty easily. And I think he just had those moments. Obviously he showed that he had heart and he didn't have no give up in him. And he has that power at any moment, even in the third round, he can finish you. But I just think his grappling is suspect. His wrestling is suspect. Even when he fought that uh, Basil uh, Hafiz, he got taken down. And then he also had like low IQ moments where he was like jumping guillotine. And I was sitting there looking at this guy like, you just show holes. You show holes in your game. And I think Usman is smart enough to see those holes and exploit those holes. Uh, but obviously JDM has great boxing. He has uh, knockout power. So I think it'll be a fun fight. But like for Usman, like you said, he has to find that guy, right? That's on that streak. Mm -hmm. And one win will get him that title shot. One win will get him in the in the talks to be there. And I for sure JDM, I think, could be that guy. All right. Well, break this down for me because I see you and Shavkat are going back and forth. Shavkat was on the show. He was talking about, you know, hey, he wants the next title shot against you. I saw something in the news about um, you know, 307, Shavkat mentioning UFC 307, but that's way too short of a turnaround. You know, you just fought. And then I saw you were talking about December. What exactly is going on and what exactly is Shavkat talking about? Can you bring us some insight on what's actually happening? Uh, I think Shavkat, like you said, he saw me and Usman going back and forth. So he's sitting there like, man, let me throw my name in the mix somehow. What do I do? And I, he, does, he's not, he doesn't seem like a trash talker. So he's like, Oh man, he turned he turned the fight down with me. He said he was going to be an active champion. Blah blah blah. I was like, yeah. I said I want to fight in December. Like, why would I want to turn around in in seventy days and fight in uh, October seventh? Which doesn't make any sense because I would. Why would I not want to fight in Abu Dhabi, which is mm -hmm. uh, you know, a couple weeks after that in front of my crowd? Uh, so I think that was just him throwing blowing smoke out there, like you said, trying to create a narrative, trying to create a storyline. And even in general, with the way he tries to create the story, like people could say whatever they want to say, right? Uh, but Shaka, his last one was against Wonder Boy. So there's not a, there's not a, man, Shaka deserves it. He's next. He's undefeated, yeah. But there's also Ian Gary's undefeated, who I think he just beat a crazy puzzle and MVP. 
So there's not really like that clear number one contender. Even when he said, you know, you didn't fight in 14 months, but I had a number one contender fight against Gilbert Burns and I fought that fight on three weeks notice. And then I waited as backup for Kobe and Leon. So don't compare your, your story to me that you just sat out for 14 months off of, you know, finishing Wonder Boy and then you didn't do nothing else after that. So, mm. so obviously I'm going to be the type. I'm not a champion. I'm not going to sit out and be like, no, I want these guys to fight and me not fight. I want to fight. I want to fight these tough tests. I want to fight these guys, but it's going to be on my timeline now. I said December works for, for me. That works best. So if the UFC wants to book that in December, uh, that's when it's going to happen. But it's not going to be on his timeline. I'm the champion. So whenever I choose to fight, that's when it's going to happen. And if, if, if I choose you, I can, I can sit there and pick who I want to fight right now. And that's who I'm going to fight. So watch your mouth. <laughs> who, if it was up to you, man, who would you want to fight in December? I think it'd just be for for me if Usman didn't lose to to Hamza and take that fight, but people forget it was a short notice fight. That would be the fight because he only lost to Leon. But mm -hmm. now he lost three in a row. I think he would need another win. So for me now, it's all right. Shavkat's the the boogeyman that they all think is unbeatable, and now I'm getting freaking a thousand comments on my Instagram page anytime I post anything of uh of the Shavkat Shavkatians. So, uh, yeah, I think for, for me, it would be another one of those tests that it, to prove people wrong, to shut them up, right? My mm -hmm. last five or six fights, everybody thought I was going to get killed. They thought I was going to lose. So he's another guy where I go out there and I, I smash him. What, what is your excuse going to be? If I go out there and I beat Usman, it's like, well, he's on a three-fight losing streak. He's done. He has no knees. Uh, you know, you just beat a bum. But if I go out there and I beat Shavkat, they're going to be like, what? Nothing. He was undefeated. He has all finishes. Uh, so now that's the guy that I'm putting my sights on. Yeah, man. 18 and uh, all finishes, like you said. How do you actually think the fight between you and Shafkat looks? Honestly, I think it looks exactly like the, the Leon fight. I think I dominated him every year. For, for me, I have a, a different style every single fight. I come in there and I don't have to fight you a certain way. There's many guys out here that are specialists that have to fight you all I can do is wrestle. All I can do is strike. All I can do is this. I can fight you going forward. I can fight you going backwards. I can fight you laterally. You know, I could wrestle you. I can strike with you. The Gilbert Burns and uh, Sean Brady fight, I didn't shoot one takedown. This Leon fight, I outstruck him and I outwrestled him. So I think for myself, I see weaknesses in Shafka that I'm going to exploit. I go into the fights and I look at my opponent's weaknesses and I take him there. I take him to where they're uncomfortable. So Shafka looks like he's not uncomfortable now because he's undefeated. But these undefeated guys, like I dealt with, with with Sean Brady, I know how to make him uncomfortable. And once I make him uncomfortable, I know how to break him. So I think that's where it's going to go with Shafka is I'm going to make him uncomfortable. And then he's going to realize that there's levels to this. And uh, I think it's going to end up being a finish. All right, guys, before we continue, just want to quickly shout out some sponsors that make this show possible, make this interview possible. First off is our friends at Manscaped. You guys can get 20% off and free shipping with the code word submission today. Manscaped has elite products that are going to change your game forever. What about the Beard Hedger? What about the Weird Whacker? What about the Lawnmower 5.0 that keeps your balls smooth and your game intact? You can jump on Manscaped today and just browse all of the great products available and of course, don't forget, it's 20% off and free shipping today. Go on, get some Manscaped in your life and support this program now. And guys, this month we have an exciting offer for everybody out there in Submission Radio land. That's right, NordVPN is back on board supporting the program and is offering you guys an extremely great deal. Click the link nordvpn.com forward slash submission now to get four extra months free on a two-year plan. By the way, there's absolutely no risk on Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. And you guys could try it today risk-free. NordVPN lets you watch sporting events, TV shows, and films that aren't available in your region. It protects your private data like bank details and passwords. It can switch your virtual location, allowing you to save money by purchasing flights, hotels, subscriptions from other countries at a cheaper price. What about the NordVPN threat protection feature that protects you from viruses, malicious malware, and phishing sites? It's the fastest VPN in the world with no buffering or lagging. It's premium cybersecurity for the price of a cup of coffee per month. And best of all, one NordVPN account can be used up to 10 devices. So go to nordvpn.com forward slash submission now. Try it today. Support the show. Support yourself. And now back to the interview. 
All right, Bilal, well, before we wrap up, I know you know you've got a lot of fans out here, especially in Australia and New Zealand. i got some fan questions for you. Let's hit these fan questions up before we wrap up. First fan question is from Knockout of the Day at KO of the Day. Who do you think is a harder fight for you, Shavkat or Kamaru Usman? A harder fight? Mm. Honestly, I would say Kamaru, just because he's fought the highest level for so long and stylistically he's one of the, has one of the best IQs in the game. So I think for, for me, fighting somebody with a close to an IQ of myself would be a harder fight. And he he still has tread on the tires. People will sit there and say, like I said, people must have forgot, right? And it's people are quick to forget about you. But he fought that fight with Hamza on eight days' notice, and it was a game of inches in that fight, right? It could, if it was mm. two more rounds in there, I would have been very interested to see how it would have went. But that was a guy that nobody thought could touch him. He was immortal, and... You know, Kamal made him look mortal on eight days' notice in Abu Dhabi. Uh, so that's why I think that he would be one of the toughest fights in the division. Mm. Uh, I got a question here from Awado. Uh, who was the toughest opponent that you faced in the UFC so far? I mean, you fought a killer's row, right? Who, who, who stands out to you as the toughest? The toughest, uh, like pre fight, I would I always say is uh, Wonder Boy because. I watched uh, a lot. My training partner is going to going to camp for him. It was Anthony Pettis fought him. T Woodley fought him. And then mm. I was watching them bring in like karate specialists, this guy, that guy. And then I asked for advice and they're like, I was like, should I bring somebody in? They're like, not, not really. It doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really help because Wonder Boy moves way differently than anybody else. And he, and he hurts, he kicks harder than anybody else. And then Wonder Boy's just like the nicest guy in the world. So from my mindset, it was like, I'm watching tape and I'm like, bro, I don't want to get spinning kicked. I don't want to get, you know, head kicked. I don't want to get one of those uh, crazy over the shoulder kicks. So he had so many highlights that I was like overthinking of that I, I worked so hard for that fight. And I think mentally I was like the most nervous for that fight. Mm, dude, how good is Wonderboy? One of the nicest guys in the game. I got another question here from your boy Troy. Um, he wants to know how many times would you want to defend the 170 belt before maybe moving up to middleweight and challenging the champ over there? And I just want to add on to that. I saw James Lynch spoke to your coach Taylor and he mentioned he wouldn't mind seeing a fight between you and Sean on 185, Sean Strickland, if he does become the champion. So just uh, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, man, I would love to fight Sean. It doesn't even have to be belt in the line. I would just fight him uh, just to fight him at 185 because uh, he ain't coming down to 70 anymore. But, yeah, that would be the fight I would want at 185. I think for myself now, it's building a legacy now. So when you look at the names that I have on my record and you look at the guys that I fought – I have a lot of the big name veterans, right? You got Wonder Boy, Maya, Gilbert Burns, Luke, A, uh, even Randy Brown, Sean Brady, and now Leon Edwards. I think maybe two more, these young guns, right? You got Shavkat, mm -hmm. then I think Ian Gary or JDM, one of those guys is going to go ahead. One of those guys either have to fight each other or, or get a win against a Kamaro or somebody, uh, or it could be Kamaro. And then I think I could start talking about somebody else because I had to take the long road to get here, right? I had to go through yeah. so many big name guys. And like I said, I have four top five wins that when you look at it, it's going to eventually be like, now I'm going to have to do a rematch. Now there's going to be another rematch. Um, but I think after two, I can start talking about it. Uh, mm. And yeah, I think it just depends on who's the champion or who's up there, right? Because if it's Sean, I would definitely want that fight and I would beg for that fight. But uh, I don't think he's going to be touching gold anymore. Dude sucks. Oh, you think DDP is going to beat him again in the rematch? Yeah, I think DDP beats him. I think that Sean's one of those guys that I think when you fight him once, you figure out his style, right? Because he's, he's awkward. He's weird with his style. And even when I, I rewatched that DDP fight like twice or uh, three times, and DDP was hitting him with some power shots and some weird, and you know, he was hurting Sean in some weird spots. And I think that he could he could have did some more with some of those spots, especially even when he took him down. I think that Sean just he has this people, you know this aura about him that people think he's crazy because he talks crazy and he says he's going to go to war and this and that. And then he goes in there and he just throws a hundred teeth kicks at you. And then he jabs and he moves away. It's not the war that you think it's going to be. I think that now once you fight him once, then you realize that. So now you start picking it up on him. And I think that DDP is going to, could end up freaking breaking him in this fight. Yeah. Wow. Well, what do you think you and Sean would look like if he, Sean was the champion? What do you look like a middleweight against him? You reckon? Oh, I slap him around. I, I literally go in there and I slap him around. Uh, Sean, when I think of uh, tough fights, 
Sean's not one of them. I think it would be an easy fight for me. He beats a lot of guys with cardio. I had better cardio than him. Uh, he beats a lot of guys with jabs. I have better boxing than him. He beats guys with teeps. But those guys, they fight him a certain way. They don't fight him smart. Costa backed up the whole time. <clears throat> and then he just took those, those teep kicks. Even with Adesanya, he backed up the whole time for the most part. And then even in that fight, it wasn't that great of a fight, right? It was Sean. If Sean never landed that cross, he could have lost a, a boring decision. Even with his coach in his corner telling him, like, Sean, you're about to lose a boring decision, even though he landed that cross. So I think people just think about his last 10 seconds of every fight, and he goes crazy, and people are like, oh, man, Sean is wild, man, and he says wild things. But he fights safe, and he fights to not get hit, and he fights to not lose. So I think I go in there and I break him with pressure, and I honestly I'll make it look easy. Mm. Last que last fan question. This one's from Real Deal O'Neill. Um, what are your thoughts on Conor McGregor? Do you think there's a path for him to fight you for the belt if he does beat Michael Chandler and looks good at one seventy? I don't think you'll look good at one seventy. The dude doesn't look good in life right now. He looks like he's coked out. He looks like he's on drugs. Uh, I don't. I mean, if he beats Michael Chandler, like I would even let him skip the line because, like I said, there's there's guys that work for it. There's guys that that got here, and then mm -hmm. even with the last fight with with Kobe skipping the line for for Leon, I'm like I would never do that because there's guys that are actually putting the work in. And for legacy wise, obviously I would want to slap Connor around, uh, but yeah, I, like there would be too much. Uh, for it not to happen, right? It took him this long to fight this fight. It took him this long to to make this fight happen with Chandler. So for them to even think that, oh, you Conor's gonna fight for the welterweight belt, then I gotta sit here and wait two years. No, nah, it's not gonna happen. Uh, I'll give it to the guys that are actually fighting, guys that are actually putting the work in, and uh, guys that deserve it. Conor doesn't deserve it. Uh, I hope he fights Chandler because I feel bad for Chandler that Chandler waited this long for it. So I hope that fight actually happens. Uh, but honestly, I don't think it happens. Dude, what would a fight week between you and Connor even look like? Can you imagine that? <laughs> Bro, I, I want to, like I said, I want that, that interaction, right? Because I want guys that go back and forth. It's funner for me when guys talk. When Kamaru's talking, it's fun. And I love the the going back and forth. It's just, I love trash talking. I love, I love hearing it. And then it makes the fight for me more exciting. When guys are the nicest guys in the world, like, you know, there's nothing that I can say. And I would even want to, like, fake it where I'm talking trash to them. Uh, you can't talk trash to Wonder Boy. You can't talk trash to the Davy Amaya. <laughs> so uh, for me, like those type of fights are the ones that are exciting for me. Those type of fights would would be fun. And I like Connor's lost his edge in the you know the trash talk game right now. Even with his last couple of fights with DDP, it just looked like bro, what the f this is Connor? It's like a fake version of Connor now. So it would be fun to embarrass him like on the mic. All right, dude. Well, as we wrap up, I, speaking of nice guys, Jason Anik, you and him do a great, a yeah. great podcast. You know, I love your show, man. Um, remember the show. Uh, one of the fan questions actually asks uh, the Don't Nerf MMA. What would be a dream guest for you and Jason uh, to have on the program? Appreciate you, brother. Yeah, Jason is my brother, man. And uh, man, a dream guest. I literally slide into DMs. That's how we. That's how we get guests. I slide into DMs <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Just to, uh, if they respond, they respond. If they don't respond, they don't respond. Uh, yeah. But it's always the funny ones that are like, they'll just leave me on scene and they won't <laughs> respond to it. I, I literally slid into Joe Rogan's DM uh, before and he left me on scene. And then he invited me on his podcast like a week later. So I was like, all right, I'll, I'll go on your podcast instead. It's, it's all good. Uh, but a dream guest for me, I think would be fun is like, uh, I mean, having Dana White on there would be hilarious, especially the game show version of it. I think he would yeah. have fun with it. So to have Dana and uh, Habib on there would, would be like a perfect, uh, you know, contest to have them two go against each other. I think that would be like the perfect show. Oh, uh, dude. Well, let's push for it online. I want to see it happen. And again, uh, man, Jason, Anik, an absolute legend in the game. Doesn't get the credit that he deserves. Everybody check out the Remember the Show podcast on the Anik Florian uh, podcast channel. And of course, follow Bilal as we get ready for the next big fight, potentially in December. We'll see who it's against at Bully B 170 for now, man, congratulations on all your success. Um, it's an inspiring story. I know there's a lot of people out there that are inspired by what you achieved by your story, but what you stand for and you represent. And I just want to congratulate you again, Bilal. Congratulations on all your success. Thank you, brother, man. Appreciate you. I, 
you know, when's the next time they're going to Australia? Maybe we'll get on that card. Yes, let's do it, brother. Let's do it. <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you so much.